At this crematorium in Delhi, the bodies lie in the heat for up to 20 hours. And there are more waiting behind these in parked cars driven by grieving relatives. The funeral pyres are so busy that families crisscross India's capital looking for any available space, some of them renting fridges to stop their loved ones from decaying. At another crematorium in the city, there are at least ambulances available to ferry the dead, though they are piled high inside. And then another queue for hours before they can be burned. India's official death toll is nearly 200,000 now, and these fires are constant, perhaps the most damning indictment of the Indian government's handling of this crisis to date. At this hospital on Delhi's outskirts, the patients are gasping for oxygen. A hundred more are waiting outside, despite being told there's not enough gas or beds. Their best hope is that if somebody here dies, then that will free up a place. We have supply of medicine, oxygen, supply bed occupancy, and day by day is So, in the situation is very bad. In future, all be zada bad hoti chahiye situation. But the bad zada, it is going from bad to worse only. This is Delhi, not some rural backwater, and the relatives of those queuing for treatment are trying to stop them from dying in the street. My father is in a very critical condition. I'm getting no help. Numbers are given there, but nobody is responding. Numbers are not reachable. Please help me, please. My father is dying, I can't afford another loss. I, yesterday I lost my younger brother. In the city of Firozabad, southeast of Delhi, this man's family say they took him to hospital, but the doctors told them they had run out of oxygen and he should be removed. So now he lies amid the rubbish here. In Bareilly, another city in Uttar Pradesh, these hospital staff are conveying the same message to furious relatives, that with no gas, there is no chance of life. And not surprisingly, they can't bear hearing it. The first delivery of breathing equipment arrived from the UK today. A humiliation for Prime Minister Modi, whose favourite slogan is a self-reliant India. And what use being the world's biggest vaccine producer when the vaccine rollout has come so disastrously late? Astonishingly, the Hindu festival of Kumela was allowed to continue along the river Ganges today, a super-spreading event in a country where the official tally of 320,000 new COVID cases takes no account of the lack of testing. और सभी लोग अपना खुद अपनी केयर करें मास्क लगा के रहें सफाई का ध्यान रखें मां गंगा मैया सबका कर सब पे अपनी कृपा बनाए रखेगी If you wondered what the worst case scenario from this global pandemic might look like then Ghaziabad east of Delhi comes close and who knows how many thousands of Indians are living and dying like this And who knows how many funerals Beyond this Delhi crematorium, makeshift cremations in parks and car parks in a country incandescent with grief. Jonathan Ruggman reporting. Well, we'll have a special programme on India's COVID disaster tomorrow. One focus in particular is the underreporting of the true scale of the crisis. Our health and social care correspondent, Victoria MacDonald, joins us now from the newsroom. Victoria. I think there is widespread agreement that the death toll and the case numbers are likely to be seriously underreported, John. Well, I've been speaking today to some mathematical modellers at the University of Michigan who have de de devised a programme to try and measure the true toll. Their modelling shows deaths could be two to five times higher than those being officially reported. And the case numbers, well, they estimate ten times higher. Uh, although there are those who think even that is an underestimate. Now, some of the reasons for this discrepancy will be obvious. Inadequate testing, uh, whether some states are not including people who had underlying health conditions, even if COVID is what killed them, and people who die without, without being counted at all. And this matters 
not just because of the inhumanity and distress, but on a practical level. It tells where to allocate resources, if you have the right numbers, when to lock down. It's about showing the scale and the urgency. And of course, it's about asking for help or having help offered from the global community. Now, you saw in Jonathan's report that this is starting to happen. The UK has sent 200 ventilators. But I suppose under those circumstances, that international aid might have kicked in sooner if the true scale of this disaster had been known. Well, you know, the experts, as I said, there are people who are speaking, but they're speaking in these alternative spaces. And they are giving figures where they're saying, you know, for every one, you add 30. And that is the kind of numbers you will get, or even more. For every uh, so one, you add 30? Yeah. One person infected, just add 30. And that is the number. And the death figures, you know, now that is more complicated because we don't know how many people are dying from other diseases, from accidents, etc. So I think that is a more complicated uh, calculation. But it is clear, even from these uh, reports that have come in through the media doing the due diligence that we need to do, that it's a huge difference between the official death rate and what is actually taking place on the ground. So, you know, and then if we factor in now the rural areas, plus the areas that are often out of sight for the media, like Northeast India, for instance, you know, I, 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 I am afraid to even think about what those numbers will be like. Why are some journalists therefore not prepared to tell the truth? Television news, uh, I hate to say it, but the majority of mainstream media television has become like a PR machine for Modi and his party and his government. Uh, the legacy media, the newspapers, the regional language newspapers, and these independent digital websites that have come up also in the last five uh, to six years, those are the spaces actually where you're getting the real information and not uh, in mainstream media. So the smaller independent spaces are able to stand up even though they face, they faced court cases, they faced all kinds of problems, but they have stuck to it. And what is heartening is, despite the fact that, of course, the mainstream media has the largest um, outreach, uh, these small spaces are making enough of an impact for the government to feel it has to crack down on them in these kind of different ways. But the fact that they're doing it just goes to show that in this age of social media, uh, these spaces have become really important for recording what is actually going on, which is what our job is as journalists. To what extent is Modi's popularity affected by any of this? So this is a very big question, which I think none of us can answer very clearly, because uh, in the course of the last six years, there have been many decisions he has made which have really affected, especially poor people, you know, starting with demonetization. Uh, and uh, last year, the lockdown, which he announced very dramatically, um, uh, at four hours notice led to this huge exodus, the largest movement of people that we have seen since partition, and all of them were poor people going back to the villages because they're daily wages. And now this mishandling of this, uh, you know, the second wave. But as I say, you know, for the last seven years, there's been such a, a, a concerted effort to build up this image of Modi as larger than the party. But what is very surprising to us, where still people are wearing masks here and told not to gather in large numbers, but in India, it seems where, after all, the position is far worse than it is here, it seems people are still gathering, gathering for religious purposes, gathering for social purposes in large numbers and no masks. You, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, uh, this is what is astounding. And, I, you know, I blame the messaging on this because this is in the hands of this government to ensure that this doesn't happen. You know, it's not somebody else's job. And why is this government not doing it? So I think, you know, I think the blame is very clear why this has happened. I mean, I think people are foolish, all right, they, are, they thought that things were over. Uh, but, uh, you know, if there's a leadership that actually gives out a clear message, I cannot believe that people will take a risk of this kind for their own lives and for their own loved ones. If that is the story in a place like Mumbai, what on earth is going on in the rural districts, which, after all, have very large populations too, if you spread them out? Yeah, and not only large populations, they have an abysmal health infrastructure. You know, there are people who are being rushed to the district centers, to the primary health centers uh, with fever and then with breathlessness. And of course, there's no oxygen. And of course, there's no testing. So there's no, 
people don't even know what they have got. And this is happening where you have a chief minister who's threatening people who talk about, you know, oxygen shortage and telling them that their property will be confiscated or they will be locked up under the National Security Act. So, you know, it's bizarre, but this is what's happening in one place that I've read about. There will be many more stories to come, I'm sure, in the days to come. Kalpana Sharma, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. It's very difficult to, to take in what you've told us because it is such a bleak picture. It surely is. And, you know, um, I don't know. There are no easy answers. And, you know, like you, I'm a journalist. I'm not in the business of um, uh, trying to hide what the reality is. And for all of us who are in the trade, it's been really difficult. Our colleagues are dying. You know, the photographer with whom I worked for many years, he died on Sunday. I mean, it's hitting people in a way that we were not hit by the last wave. Kalpana Sharma, thank you very, very much for talking to us. Thank you.